All right, we can get started. Um, I will continue to let folks in if, as they're signing on. But welcome everybody. My name is Karen Pelletier and I am um, with the Worcester Regional Chamber of Commerce. I'm really happy that you were able to join us here for our second to last event of 2020. That feels good to be saying after this year. I'm sure a lot of folks are a little worn out. Um, so we have one more event coming up and it's tomorrow. It's our business after hours, which we will have a special guest who's Paul Wengender from The Greater Good Brewing. So he's gonna have a fun update for us. I wanted to let you know that today's um, round table will be recorded. And so we'll be able to send this out to you and to anyone who missed it um, after the fact, but just wanna let folks know that you're being recorded. Um, a few other things I just wanted to let everybody know if you or your company would be willing, I know a lot of you on here already do, but we would be willing to sponsor one of our 2021 chamber events. Um, we do have a lot of opportunities right now um, for 2021. So I'd be happy to talk with you about that. You can reach out to me in the chat or an email and we can go over some opportunities for you. So I just want to review the format. So we have a guest speaker here today. We're happy to have with us. We're going to have um, some sponsor remarks and then we'll kick it off with Christopher Bender. Um, and then at the end of his presentation, if anyone has any questions, we'll have some open time for Q&A. Um, and that's pretty much it. So we'll have you out of here by one for sure. So you can grab some lunch if you didn't get a chance to do that before you sat down. Um, so right now, it's my pleasure to introduce Kate Sherry. Um, Kate is our supporting sponsor, representing our supporting sponsor, Gallagher. So Kate. Thanks, name. Karen. Hi, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Hope everyone's getting ready for some snow. I'm working from down the Cape, um, and I think they, they kind of downgraded it here, but we were a little, well, we got a little nervous about it. So it's going to be a good old fashioned nor'easter here with the, with the wind down here. But um, again, Kate Sherry, I'm area vice president of Gallagher Benefit Services. We are a proud member of, uh, of the Chamber of Commerce and uh, like to support the Chamber in any way that we can um, is my role as past uh, chair of the board of directors, um, and we try to get involved with as many of the events as possible. And I know as so many um, businesses have shifted to meet their needs of their clients, largely due to COVID, the chamber has done that as well too, with uh, still offering these um, the financial roundtables and a lot of other events online, which uh, which I really enjoy. I think it's um, sometimes it's, it's even easier to be able to jump onto something like this than to, um, you know, to go over to the chamber. Not that there aren't lovely accommodations over there too in their new space. Um, but I'm looking, yeah, looking forward to this today. I think cybersecurity, um, especially with COVID, we're gonna hear about um, how important it really is. And I know that this presentation is geared largely for financial firms. Um, my client base uh, is mainly for health insurance. Um, so a lot of my clients deal a lot with protected health information. And I do a lot with the carriers, Harvard Pilgrim, Blue Cross and Blue Shield. So um, cybersecurity, I mean, obviously reaches across many different industries. Um, it's really important. I know a lot of my clients look for lines of coverage to help protect from that. Um, so uh, again, we're happy to be a uh, supporting sponsor here for this financial roundtable, and um, looking forward to what Chris um, information he has to give us today. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for your support this year, Kate. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Lou Savara from Bowditch and Dewey Attorneys. Um, Bowditch is our presenting sponsor for the financial services roundtable for 2020 um, and a great partner for the Worcester Chamber, certainly. Um, and so, and Lou is going to introduce our keynote speaker after his remarks. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and thank you all for joining. Lou. Thanks, Karen. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Lou Savara. Uh, as Karen said, I'm a partner of Bowditch. This is my 35th year at the firm. And uh, uh, I, I can honestly say I, I've never missed my office more than I do right now. Uh, but we all get used to it and uh, I'm working from, from home today. Uh, we were talking earlier, I don't know about you guys, but I feel like my days now go from six in the morning until eight at night with no break. Uh, and uh, it's certainly something that hasn't made life any easier, but, but we're gonna get back and it'll all happen. Uh, first, let me say on behalf of my partners at Bowditch, uh, happy holidays to everybody. Um, 
uh, we're getting close and I'm sure everybody's busy doing a lot of different things, getting ready for them in their own way. And it's certainly gonna be a different year, um, but it's gonna happen and we're hopefully everybody enjoys it and stays healthy and, and has a wonderful holiday. Um, the outage, uh, as Karen mentioned, is a sponsor of the financial services round table. We sponsor others. Um, we think these are great opportunities to get people together with a specific industry focus. Um, and certainly those of you in the financial services industry, uh, whether it be accountants, bankers, uh, financial advisors, um, all have certain common legal issues that you face. And we try to bring you speakers that will address specifically uh, the issues that you face. Um, we, as, as I hope you know, have, uh, have a very big presence uh, in the financial services industry. We represent uh, probably most of the banks and, and many insurance companies and agencies, uh, accounting firms. And so it, it's a big part of our practice, a big part of my practice. Um, what we thought about uh, today um, is, and there's a lot of uh, presentations and discussions on cybersecurity and data security, uh, but we thought it would be appropriate and, and helpful to you to have one that was really focused on your industry and, and could speak to some of the unique challenges uh, that you face. Um, our speaker today, Chris Bender from uh, Norcross uh, Group up in Portland, is somebody that I've gotten to know over the past year. Um, uh, we're, we're pretty good at addressing the legal issues. We are not technical people. So we decided as a firm and, and in my practice, the best way to meet our clients' needs uh, is to find really best of breed on the technical side. And, and we, we've worked with a lot of good firms. There's a lot of good firms out there. We think uh, Chris and Norcross no cross is, is, is among the best, if not the best. And we've worked on, on projects together with other clients. Um, and I really, having, having worked with Chris, thought uh, it would be incredibly valuable for, to expose him to you folks. Um, uh, and that's our goal here today. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to, to Chris right now because he's the one with the substantive expertise. I want to personally thank him for taking time out of his day to be with us today. Uh, and thank all of you for taking time to be here today. It's important to support these chamber events. Uh, we want to keep them going. Um, and uh, and I know on behalf of my partners in the chamber, we appreciate your support. So thank you. And I'll turn it over to Chris. Thanks, Lou. And appreciate the kind words. And good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Lou, and to your partners at Bowditch for the sponsorship and Kate, your sponsorship and Karen for putting this together. And I'm going to share a deck. So you have something else to look at besides me. So that's my gift to all the attendees today. And uh, take you through some information and some things which we, um, as Lou mentioned, uh, I'm from a firm called North Cross Group or NCG, and we do a lot of work in cybersecurity and response. We work in our primary industries, our financial services. Uh, we also work in healthcare. We also work in transportation, and we work in the federal space. And this has been an extremely busy year for us. And one of the reasons is because of all the things that have changed with the way that we're working because of COVID and the way people have altered their operating models and how their operating models of their clients and their customers and the third parties they work with have also changed. And that's resulted in a lot of significant activity by bad actors, whether they are criminal elements, nation states, and everything in between, there's a lot going on there. And so we're going to talk about some of those things, uh, share some stories. Uh, since we have a relatively small group here, if anyone wants to ask anything or uh, has a thought as we go through it, please feel free to unmute yourself and uh, shout it out, or we can cover those questions at the end. Either way, we'll work just fine. So let's jump right into it. So uh, with COVID, with us not interacting and working in our offices, as Lou mentioned earlier, or traveling or going to conferences and things like that, we've had a couple of interesting things happen. And the whole notion of the virtual and remote workforce and the constructs that we're dealing with are much different than we would have ever planned on at the beginning of this year from what we're looking at today. And even with vaccines moving and starting to roll out, we're probably looking at a, a new type of workforce or work location or office uh, going forward for the foreseeable future. You have a lot more people thinking that they're going to work virtually on a continuing basis. Certainly, there's still a lot of companies who are electing to keep people out of the office for at least another quarter or so. So you've got a number of things that have changed. Now, there's some opportunities there when it comes to the technology side of things that you can look at with uh, 
connecting and using people in different geographic locations a little bit more seamlessly. What you can do as far as your business continuity plan and exact recovery capabilities. We we're talking a little bit before earlier about snow coming through. How people work through snowstorms is a little bit different this year than it was this time last year. So there's just some interesting things and there's some benefits and things that you can do a lot with saving money, looking at uh, pulling back on physical office space. But there's also some things to think about from a risk standpoint. And that's what we're going to be focusing on today in this discussion. So when we first all started moving into the virtual format back in March and April of uh, this past year, uh, one of the big things everyone was talking about was video conferencing and how to get people connected. And you know, we had a lot of, and there's plenty of jokes that have been done on uh, sketch shows and in commercials about people trying to figure out if people can hear them, if they're muted, all that other stuff, and what the camera's picking up. But what you got is you have people working uh, full work days, full schedules and things of that sort out of their homes. Um, that's not how a lot of companies were initially set up with. We do a lot of work with banks and we had a, a group where we helped move their trading desk operation, which they had said they would never have thought they ever would have had any circumstances whatsoever as to where they would virtualize that. And that is how they're working now. And so you've got some interesting constructs. So uh, bring up some key consideration areas here, kind of one at a time, just to highlight highlight them is that because the work uh, environment and the environment and ecosystem that people are using is different, it's a time where we need to look at our internal governance and risk management. So for all of you working in the financial services sector, and we have some folks from other sectors as well, if you're in any of those critical infrastructure spaces, you've got something in place to look at what your governance is and what your risks are. And you think about those things and see how things are set up. The way you're operating today in most cases is going to be quite or very significantly different than it was this time last year. And so with any of the constructs and any of the rules out there, so if you fall under banking or you fall under SEC rules or uh, any of the other type of standard uh, guidelines that are out there from a cybersecurity standpoint for different types of industries, there's always the notion that you need to look and address at these things on a regular basis or when something changes. What we've done here with COVID and the way we're working and the way our partners are working and the way our clients are working, everything's changed. And so this is definitely a time to look at those frameworks and make sure you're in good shape. That brings into the notion cybersecurity and privacy. We have people using their own devices. They're certainly using their own home networks. They might be using some sort of combination of devices. What does that mean for security and privacy? From everything from what people print, what they watch and look at on their screens, to how they interact with third parties has changed. So we need to look at those considerations and figure out, do we need to change anything that we have in place to monitor those, to look for problems, and to make sure that we can respond to any problems. And that gets into incident management, which is the other piece to it. The way in which we respond to incidents is not the same way today than it was a year ago when we had called up the help desk and there were functions and things that they needed to do across the network. It's different when people are working from their homes or working from a, another home or another location that they've gone to while they're quarantining. Lots of different things there. And everything that's happening to us is also happening to all of our third parties, all the vendors that are supporting us. It's not like this is an isolated thing just here in uh, New England. Like for instance, we have uh, an office here in New England. We also have one in the Midwest and we have one down South. We could be having a Nor'easter and we talk to some of our folks and it's 60 degrees where they are. Uh, that's not the case with the things that we've done around COVID. Everyone has made some types of adjustments. And that's something we need to think about. What have our partners done? What have our vendors done? And how does that impact us. For those in banking, OCC 2013-29 means that we need to make sure that they are doing the things that we do. And if we're doing things differently, inherently, that's something we need to look at what they're doing. So we'll get a little bit more into that as well. The other piece too then is, uh, the last piece, is the corporate culture elements and the training that we have for people. People are working differently. As, again, Lou mentioned earlier, the longer days and starting in the morning, working throughout the course of the day and things of that sort. What does that do to how people are interacting with things? We'll go through an example in a little bit to go through some of the tactics that are being used by some bad actors. When you are working longer hours or you are dealing with multiple variables, like you're trying to get work done, you're on a conference call and you're 
child or grandchild runs in and is doing different things, whatever it may be, those are different levels of distraction. And those are also some of the things that people are taking advantage of at the moment. And just the situation itself with COVID and the strain that's going on, especially in different industries. We see a lot of this with our healthcare partners and clients. There's uh, a lot of other things going on that are certainly things that are fodder for those bad actors. Okay, so let's just go real quickly to understand the risks. I won't read these three to you, but I know Karen is sending out this deck, so you can use these as a, a uh, reference and look into some of these things. And I've got some links in the deck too with some other resources where a lot of this material comes from. But things to look at and think about is looking at the personal use of uh, devices. So people using their own devices at home, certainly using their own network, their own protection to the internet. Even if you're on a VPN, they're still going traversing their own networks through the internet to get to you. What are some of the things that you need to do? Now, these are not just technical questions. And as Lou was mentioning, we work with, uh, with him and some of his partners on some of this stuff. This is very much a confluence of understanding the legalities and the programmatic pieces, as well as the technical pieces. So with people working at home, do you have the technical controls and the monitoring in place? By the same token, do you have the policies and procedures and employment agreement and meaningful, or excuse me, acceptable use types of functions and documents in place so that people know what's expected of them and what to do in various different situations? Thinking about the platforms you're using, they're using cellular connections, they're using Wi-Fi when they typically would use wired connections, they're using VPN, not using VPNs. Those are all important considerations. We're not going to get into those details today, but those are things you need to be asking about within your organization and figuring out where we stand today. Data loss and exposure using those personal devices, using those different platforms, we have things that are being shared and exposed. Even as we're sharing things right now through a Zoom meeting, the way Zoom interacts with uh, its different endpoint clients is different than you would typically share files. Your ability to share data and information, and like we're doing right now with screen shares, has a lot of different uh, aspects of potential data loss and exposure because of those platforms. Are those things that your employees and your teams understand? Do they understand that when they're interfacing with clients or customers, how those things work. Those are things you want to make sure that you're not leaving up to chance, but actually spending some time and energy on to figure out what's needed within the organization with the way we're working today and make sure folks have that. Being uh, familiar with fraud and criminal activity, it is rampant. Um, if I were ranking them, and I think this uh, agrees with most of the data, to put healthcare at the top of the target list, but financial services is always near the top. And so if they're not number one, they're number two. And in that space, so uh, we, we heard from people earlier working in both of those, uh, fraud and criminal activity is at rampant levels. Um, I've been in this space for almost 34 years. And I've never seen the level of activity that we're seeing right Right now. So make people aware of that. Make sure they understand that that is very actively happening. I talked a little bit about this before, but make sure you understand where your third parties are and your vendors in this whole space and what they're doing. And then the uh, final piece there is also thinking about insider threats, yeah, something we don't usually like to focus on too much. Some of that can be intended and some of it can be unintentional, but understanding the risks you have from your internal uh, players is also something. And it plays into some of the other things we just covered. The fact that folks are using their own personal and not the corporate type of networks and communication devices and actual devices, their computers, their laptops, their tablets, phones, whatever it may be. Those are all part of things that you need to understand as your current risk profile. We'll kind of keep going through here. Now, these are some quick examples, and I won't walk you through this. Again, it's something that you can read through, but it's getting into the notion of things being entwined from a technical and a programmatic or a legal standpoint. When you're talking about anything, and you can see the, the green uh, uh, text on the left versus the blue stuff on the right, look at things like third-party connections to your network and insider threat programs. All of these things have technical components and also programmatic or legal components. You need to look at both. And sometimes as we we work with things, especially since people have been jumping into the COVID stuff, we focused on just the technical. Let's make sure everyone can connect. Let's make sure they can share files. Let's make sure they can see each other on Zoom, things of that sort. And that's great. Once you've got the technical pieces there, that's one side of the equation. The other side is, do you have all of the policies, procedures? Do you have the agreements? Do you have the various other controls that you have codified and put in place with your vendors and third parties to make sure they're doing things properly on those platforms? And these uh, graphics and the text take you through a couple of considerations to think about and work through with your organizations to make sure that you've covered all those different areas. 
All right, we're going to go through an example here, and it's one which um, we've used in a couple of different areas, and I, I use it primarily because it's it's very important and it's hitting a lot of folks, and it, it can hit you from a personal standpoint or a business standpoint, but it's also a way to go through and walk through these different elements and the different types of risk areas that we just went through using a specific example. So what we're going to talk about is malware and ransomware, and looking at it from the context of how does the current threat landscape work look right now in that space and how do our operating models now work since we've been through COVID and now we're starting to look on the other side of it and start to move forward and what has changed over these past so many months and what's going to be with us indefinitely or for the foreseeable future. Okay, so malware and ransomware, just uh, using a, a little bit of context here. So you know, people toss these terms around, so I'll just kind of go through some of the basics of it. So uh, give a little context for everyone. So malware, ransomware, what it typically does is one of three things. It steals information, it encrypts information in the sense of encryption can be a good thing, but it can be a bad thing if someone else encrypts your information and you can't use it. So they basically make it unusable for you. The other thing it does is deliver other types of malware. Um, as you've probably heard with the news, with the solar wind stuff that we've been talking about in the news for the past couple of days, uh, you had stuff that had been deployed months and months and months ago, and you, it was sitting dormant, some of it, some of it was being used, other components might still be out there and things that we're looking for. Usually when you have these types of uh, malicious software that get in, one of the things they try to do is figure out either how to replicate or to have different points that can be undetected. So if they have five things out there, if we find three, there's still two more out there that can bite you. That's a very typical strategy that these things use. Um, how do you get those? Uh, for the most part, it's some very basic things. It's email phishing. So people getting an email that asks them to go to a particular website or to click on a link or to download something. That's a very, very typical path in. Um, you have software vulnerabilities and we work with a lot of banks. They have a lot of older platforms. They have some pieces of software from acquisitions or they have a piece of uh, software that they can't turn off because they don't know if they can turn it back on again when it's sitting on a very old computer. Those operating systems and different pieces of software have vulnerabilities in them which are very known out there and there are lots of exploits and uh, that's what's being targeted. Uh, the other thing is poor access controls. One of the good things in the financial services, it's an area that we tend to be pretty decent on in that space because of the uh, practice we've had in plugging those up over the years, but still poor access controls in a number of areas can be exploited. Uh, just have a list of malware and ransomware, some of the trending stuff. None of that makes uh, is anything you need to memorize or pay attention to. Just trying to give you an idea that there's a lot out there and uh, you've got all sorts of different variants to be paying attention to. Okay, so what this malware is doing and something that you want to make your folks uh, familiar with is it's targeting end users. It's not going after the main firewalls. It's not going after the core system, but it's on the periphery and it's doing things like talking about money and payments. Um, it's using events that are happening in the world like uh, People have had a tough year because of COVID. We want to do something extra for uh, the holidays. So we want to buy some gift cards. Can you go to this link on Amazon or Best Buy and, and order gift cards for the office or things of that sort? They're using social engineering tactics to say, you know, if you don't, if you don't believe in this, that's terrible. You need to show your support for this. Click on this to sign this online petition or whatever it may be. And those links are not going to where the end user thinks they're going to. And they're getting pretty sophisticated. And how they do this. Um, and they're also using things like LinkedIn. They're using things like uh, things that are on Facebook and other social media things to try to understand what people might be interested in or what they think about, or to look at one party versus the other and uh, try to pretend to be the other one based on information they can garner online. There are actually tools out there that will go and mine that type of information and build profiles on people get that stuff for free on the internet and build those things. And it allows you to be quite effective if you're a bad actor with using various types of social engineering tactics. What happens then is the victim clicks on something and opens it and various other things and they initiate this activity. When we're talking about remote work and people working at home or working on a variety of devices, we don't always have the same number and types of security tools in the mix. And so these things become more problematic. 
Um, the initiating event, most of the time, it is a user clicked on something, it's something in an email or something on a site that they shouldn't be on, either uh, knowingly shouldn't be on or that they didn't realize they were on, but they are clicking something and they are clicking something from inside. So it's inside a VPN, it's inside a company network or behind certain types of controls. And that's giving people uh, a route in. So that also means that all the things and all the energy you spent on protecting your endpoints with your firewalls and how you protect your connection to the internet, they're still working just fine, but because someone on the inside who has the ability to traverse back and forth basically provided the conduit for someone to come in or for software to come in and uh, become a problem. So addressing some of the weakest links here. And again, as we talked about earlier, there's a number of these areas. This is an example, but phishing attacks today account for about 90% of the data breaches out there. From the testing that folks do, we do it too. For the most part, you're looking at about a third of every fake and fraudulent email you send out that someone's opening it. And so the things that you need to look at in that space are not necessarily to lock certain more things down or to, uh, you know, and not knocking the insurance piece that we talked about earlier to look for more coverage. You need to also look to people because they are part of this and they are part of the problem, but also part of the solution. Things like mindfulness and accountability on the individual. And to that point, when people are working from home in their own little cocoon that they have in their homes, that kind of mindfulness and accountability is incredibly important for them being part of the solution to help protect themselves and protect the company's data and systems. And one of the things we stress a lot in this space is to make sure that we're not giving them the way out with a reliance on the IT department or the help desk, who in many cases during this whole thing are still working out their basements and their home offices. We want people to have some accountability and know how to take care of some of these things on their own. We're not trying to make people uh, incident responders. What we are trying to do is make sure that they understand what their responsibilities are and what the things they can do to protect themselves are as well. Okay, so mindfulness, in case the term might, may not mean too much to anyone on the call, but what we want to talk about there is memorization versus mindfulness. And I'm sure that all of you take some level of annual required IT or cybersecurity training that you need to take. Um, probably not all the most fun thing that you look forward to every year. And a lot of it is they give you a bunch of things. They give you a little test afterwards. You got to make sure that you remember what they had. And you're, you're basically memorizing stuff and, and those types of things. There's nothing wrong or bad with it. But one of the problems is it sometimes uh, desensitizes people. They're not really paying attention to anything. They're memorizing whatever they need to do to answer the 10 or 12 or 15 or 20 questions at the end, get the score they need so they get their little check mark and off they go. What we find most useful when we're working with organizations to help them in that space is to give them things where people can understand stuff and give them some tools that they can use when they encounter something. So again, back to some of those risks and threat areas we talked about earlier, those are the things uh, the variables, the things change, and things that are different that allows them to use what they do have inherently with their wisdom and their knowledge and their solutioning and problem solving to help be part of the solution and not just something that you need to protect from. And so we'll take a look at what we mean by that. So for instance, a lot of companies, a lot of banks, and we do this for some of them too, because it's something that they feel is very important. You, they run phishing uh, email campaigns. So they're sending fraudulent emails to say, uh, you need to sign up for something to know if you're ever coming into the office or not for uh, during the COVID restrictions in the state. Uh, there's something to register for the 401k, various things like that. And you're trying to get trick people to click on different links and that kind of stuff. Um, and that's fine. It's just that it's they tend they're pretty expected nowadays. People are pretty good at seeing some of the usual things with misspellings or different logo colors and things of that sort. But when you want to really get people to think about how those things are being used and things like that, some of the tactics are treating it a little bit differently and saying, let's walk through the scenario and play around with it. Um, Let's look at some of the tactics that are used based very specifically on your job category. They're not general corporate type of things, because that's how they're coming in. If you're talking about a bank situation, for instance, or an investment uh, organization or a broker dealer or what have you, they're not sending you general things just about 401ks. What they're doing is they're sending things specific to different roles and job tasks that people have. They're using the names of parties internally. So 
make sure that when you give them examples to think about, do that. Use your knowledge to show them how sophisticated some of these can be. One of the best pieces of advice we give people in this space is think before you click on anything and start to ask, what What's, what am I being asked to do? What's the timing uh, considerations that are being put on it? What is the purpose and why would I be asked to do this and how appropriate it, is it for me? And then if you've taken that second or that heartbeat to think about that stuff, that's enough to give you an indication that before you click on anything, you probably want to cross check and see, is this something that's correct and right? When I do that, if don't respond to that particular email. Say, are you really sure you want me to do this? But look for other ways to cross check and make sure that something's uh, correct and, and proper. So verify it through another channel. Those types of things don't need any randomization. These are things that are somewhat common sense, but in the midst of a workday, in the midst of uh, overloaded work schedule and, and workload, those are things that sometimes people don't take a moment to think about. And in this environment and where we're working, though, these are very powerful tools to help people be effective in rooting out some of this stuff and not falling prey to various tactics. So organizations, your plans, your policies and procedures, whether you are a hospital, whether you're a doctor group or you're a private practice accountant, you need to kind of look at what you have in place with your plans and the policies and procedures you have. Policies and procedures, for those of us in the regulated space, we know those terms, but really putting it more in plain language is really about what does an organization do for certain things? How do we work? How do we make sure we protect ourselves against things like malware and ransomware and what have you? And the procedures are just how we do those things. So it's the what and how. You want to make sure that people who are working remotely, working virtually, know what is expected of them by the organization. And again, we've changed a lot of those over this past year. So every organization needs to take a beat to say, well, let's really think about that. How do we want to address some, some of these things? And maybe some of the what pieces need to be addressed too, just because of the different ways that we are working. Uh, one of the institutions we work with, with the trade desk that I mentioned earlier, some of the what they do needed to be redefined because the policies they had in place for that particular area organizational unit just were operating extremely different today than they did a year ago. And so they needed to relook at some of those things. And then thus the how part and the procedural part needed to change as well. So taking a look at those things and paying attention to what's really happening out there is important. And you know, anecdotally, that's how you make things like your plans and your policies and procedures much more effective for the organization and not just something people give a glancing review to on an annual basis and check off that they read it. It's actually something useful to them in their day-to-day -day job. All right, uh, I won't walk through these in any great detail, but just kind of some of the things that we add into those are things where we give people checklists. So for instance, working at home, uh, looking at your network internally, give them some things to walk through. And again, I'll give you a couple of sites at the end of this presentation to take a look at. They have some great um, tools around this, but you know, one of the basics ones are system and network hygiene, going through this list. And again, I won't read through all this stuff, but making sure that things are updated and patched, make sure that things are up to date, make sure you've got backups and they're tested, things of that sort. These are things that don't need to be very difficult, but they can be passed on to folks. And maybe they, in a given person looking at their home office can't or won't do all of these things or understand all of them, but if they do some of them, you're moving forward and you're progressing. And over time, people will get more familiar with these terms and what they're doing. You can build different types of functions to help them with this, to show them different steps, but keep it simple and not a just a long list of things, but give them a manageable number of things that they can do to help progress things further. Because again, security isn't a, a one, um, only one uh, solution path. It's a combination and layer of different things. So if it's a list of 10 things for a system and network hygiene, or it's a list of eight, or it's a list of 12, that's not as, as important, but taking care of some of the things on that list and continuing progress in that area is very important. And when you do have uh, employees and workers and contractors working remotely, working at home, making sure they understand to do these things there, just as they would have in the office or someone else would have for them in the office is very important. 
Okay, so um, these are then some of the things also to respond. And this is something that we have a lot of our clients doing with their folks is if something does happen and they do uh, are suspecting that something has hit them like malware, ransomware, make sure they know what to do. Um, we found that in many cases and breaches that we've been working with recently, things started with things that happened at home. They didn't realize it was anything that they should report. And they're finding out about some of this stuff in the uh, organization days or weeks later, which has given a lot of time for things to happen. So provide them with some uh, steps to take. Again, we won't necessarily run through this and just in the interest of time, we'll move forward, but um, you can give them a couple of fairly simple, easy steps to take and read. And again, those sites at the end, I'll give you, have a number of these different things of what you do for things like malware, ransomware, what you think about fraudulent phone calls, uh, things of that sort, just so people have some tools that kind of give them a pathway of this is what to do. You don't need to lecture them on the subject, but just give them some practical steps that they can follow. Okay. Another thing that we find extremely helpful and much more helpful than your sometimes even your typical type of awareness programming and training program is to run tabletop exercises. And this is something that works nicely over Zoom meetings and I keep uh, mentioning Zoom, but whatever you use as an online uh, platform, Teams, WebEx, et cetera, um, going through tabletop exercises, uh, having someone walk people through, you don't necessarily have to role play anything in different positions, let people do what they need to do, but give them a situation, a scenario, and have them walk through it. Uh, these things can be done in as short as 15 minutes, but it's like, for instance, what would you do if you got a sus suspicious looking email? Or if you got an email that didn't look suspicious, but it was asking you to do something that was involved with uh, providing a uh, do interacting with anything outside of your network, anything that was interacting with financial information, anything that was act, interacting with personal information, things of that sort, and walk through that scenario. The exercise of going through that scenario and people playing along with it and you know, making sure that they're actually really playing along with it and thus the notion of the exercise, so everyone should basically be a part of it, helps them get the synapses in their brains going to say, hmm, this is how something like that would work and these are things that I can keep in mind if such a scenario comes in. It also allows you to figure out, do you have all the right people who are dealing with an incident? So for instance, dealing with an email, that's, that's one thing that probably could affect everyone in the organization. If you want to get into other scenarios with looking at how you respond to reported incidents, you might be dealing with people in IT, but you may also need to be talking to the folks in compliance, in legal, internal audit, HR, a variety of other areas in order to deal with all the things that you need to do. That in and of itself helps people realize that, who do I need to talk to and work with? And all these things should be reflected in your procedures and your policies and that kind of stuff. So your output from these exercises can also help you make the, sure that those are appropriately updated and they're saying the things that they need to say. And again, they're practical and realistic for your organization. Okay, so some quick uh, ransomware best practices here, just in case anyone does happen to come up with it and keeping with our um, example here. Uh, it, the, the recommendations from the, uh, from the feds, from industry experts and all that other stuff is not to pay ransoms. And still today we get asked this question all the time of should you pay a ransom and uh, what kind of numbers should you be looking at? Do you negotiate with them and those types of things? One of the pieces of advice we usually give is, um, and I actually had this exact conversation earlier this week with a small rural hospital and they were saying that ransom's not very expensive. It's kind of, uh, it's going to be hard for us to try to figure out how to recover for this. Should we do it? Um, and the, the starting point is these are, this is an actor who is holding you ransom for information that you need to uh, treat people to save lives and all sorts of other things. This is not necessarily a virtuous, reputable entity that you're dealing with. So going into a business transaction with them, does that make sense? And under any other circumstances, would you do that? And so the time and energy spent around that might be better spent figuring out how to get your systems back up and running. So to that point, the bullet points we have there is making sure that your backups are running, checking them regularly, uh, having more than one spot where your backups exist and testing them and validating are things that we like to focus on with people. And again, the things that we've walked through with this malware ransomware example apply to all the risks and threats that we covered in the beginning area, but just some ways to structurally walk through those and look at that uh, with the lens of where we are today with where people are working, how they're working, and also our third parties and our end customers and clients.
So we'll leave you here with just uh, five things to do after this session. I appreciate you kind of sitting through this and listening to what we had to say here. So um, is going back to your organization, make sure you are looking at your controls and saying we may have been in great shape come February, but a lot of things changed in March. And now looking forward into 2021, things are still going to be different. So are all the things that we had in place to protect us and to deal with threats out there are still effective and do they really work or do we need to alter anything? Uh, do some awareness training. Uh, everything's changed. Things have changed for everyone out there. So going through some of those and walking people through some of those scenarios and you don't need to hit everything, but you do need to get a few things to get them thinking about it. And that's the key to awareness. Awareness is just getting people to process the fact that things have changed. People know that on one level, but understanding from the context of how they're doing things with your organization's data and systems is a very powerful tool. Uh, doing some quick checkups on your cyber hygiene and making sure some of those things are in place, like the list that was in the deck earlier, going through and talking to some of the folks in your IT department, but also talking to some of the folks in legal and compliance and accounting and going through some of those pieces to make sure they're thinking about how their different systems and processes are, are protecting or uh, working a little differently when people are working remotely and um, virtually. Um, the other thing is in this new environment, making sure the definitions of roles and responsibilities and what you have in your procedures and your policies and other guidelines still make sense. And do they still work right and still work properly with uh, the type of work environment that we have today? And the last piece is doing things like tabletop exercises. You don't need to have a uh, very uh, rope, uh, uh, sophisticated and complex setups for it. It'd be a simple meeting and session, but it's a great way to get people to think about things and to look at how they're doing that. And it doesn't need to be a pure cyber event. It can be an operational procedural type of thing that you weave some of the cyber pieces in there. It's a very effective tool. And then I mentioned a couple of sites and the, the links are down here and I think Karen's sending the deck out as well. Um, but CISA, uh, uscert.cisa.gov has a number of different uh, lists of tools, cyber hygiene things. They have tabletop exercise examples that you can download there. Everything's for free there. Um, some of it is a little uh, techno speak, but it for the most part is in pretty normal business language, some great resources on there. The other thing is the MITRE attack site, uh, which is attack.mitre.org. MITRE is a nonprofit organization that's uh, funded in part by the government and works a lot with the federal agencies. And they have one of the best lists of the things that are out there and things that are trending. And if you need examples for walking through a tabletop exercise or something like that, you certainly can use some of the examples we used in this deck, but they always have new information in there. And they also have all the technical things of what you need to do to fix some of the exposure that you have there or to protect against things. And it's a site that yeah, you go th uh, check it out in the morning. It's going to be different in the afternoon. So there's a lot of good information. MITRE's site is a little more technical and it can be a little overwhelming for folks. So just keep that in mind. But the CISA site is great for anyone who wants a little bit more information and some tools to move forward with. So uh, that's takes us to the conclusion of things here. And I appreciate the opportunity to share some of this stuff with you all and hope you're able to use some of this in your organizations to help better protect yourselves and move forward. And I'll echo Lou's thing and very happy holidays to folks and certainly happy to take any questions if anyone has any. Great. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, as he said, um, we want to make sure that you have an opportunity to ask any questions while he's um, here with us today. So you can feel free to unmute yourself. I know I will use your term. I'm very glad that you were able to um, present this in a non-tech talk way um, for those of us who get overwhelmed by that kind of um, language. I felt your presentation was very, you know, digestible. So any questions? Sure. Sacha, do you have one? Uh, no, I just would echo with you what you said. I think it's a very important topic, and particularly me being in the you know, industry of financial planning and investments, uh, it becomes more essential for me to see that we do all kinds of protection. And um, most of the time, I think the organization or the firms that you work with, they have their own security you know, group that they alert us what to do and come and check up in our office that we're all doing things the way it should be done. 
So I know that I have, I have had I have had someone who is overlooking everything, but not every every place is like that. So your talk your talk was very uh, informative and uh, useful. I've heard some other you know cyber uh, seminars like this, and many places they like uh, people to have some insurance coverage uh, for this purpose in case you know there is some kind of flaws left and clients are bringing some litigation issues. Do you have any idea about you know, how expensive are those insurances? Uh, is it like worth going for it? I do have, but I'm, I'm just asking for people to know how expensive it could be if one has to protect themselves with taking some insurance. Yeah, and uh, there's certainly a number of ranges, but for basic cyber writers to cover some basic things, you can get them actually fairly inexpensively. And um, those are something to talk to your insurance brokers about or just do some research on your own. And certainly a good thing to have. Um, if you process data and you are doing any specific data processing or handling in, in different areas, that's where um, your insurance costs will go up very significantly and very quickly. Uh, if you're a larger entity, Entity, there's also points where you're probably not going to be able to get insured for your infrastructure. Like, for instance, if you're uh, a large uh, financial uh, transaction processor and self-insurance is something you're going to have to look at, which is a completely different ballpark, too. What we find is that most entities, especially smaller ones, and I'll, I'll define what I'm calling smaller, is you're looking at companies um, under $50 million in revenue. Um, uh, like your, yourself, you're not processing information, but you are, you do probably have custody of information of personal information, financial information of your clients. So you do need some protections there. If you get into a breach scenario and you have uh, disclosures, you have to remediate, uh, mitigate anything on your own things. You have to uh, reach out to clients, provide them things like uh, identity protection, uh, theft notification, those types of things. Uh, most of the insurance coverage that people find gets uh, eaten up very quickly with the things that they need to do from recovery standpoint, legal fees, technical fees, whatever. Um, so the the levels of most of the base programs um, are, are good for minor things, but if you have something where you've got a fairly large client base, if you are holding things that fall under things like uh, your typical type of banking protections, your SEC type of provisions, your HIPAA provisions on the healthcare side, you're, you may need to be looking at what doing some exercise of what your actual costs are, because most of the typical policies that an insurance company will provide you and quote you will certainly cover some of those costs, but they may not cover all of it. And that's where you need to look at the mechanics of it. And we've had a number of institutions which have struggled with saying solvent after a breach, just because of the outlay that they've had to do. So certainly something to think about and, and using more of a business forecast model with it than you might with some typical insurance things because the types of direct costs, uh, fines, penalties, and other indirect costs that you have in that situation can mount up very, very quickly, no matter how small you are. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your input and the information. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Karen, it's Lou. Yeah. I, I just thought, it, you know, first of all, Chris, I just want to say thank you. Um, uh, every, every time every time we talk, I feel like I want to move to Western Pennsylvania and throw my phone and my computer in the ocean. <laughs> uh, but, but that's not going to happen. <laughs> so uh, I appreciate uh, you reminding me and all of us um, about how pervasive and how important all of this is. Um, I guess I would say uh, to the group, uh, based upon what we're seeing from clients, and this is a, a weekly call that I get from somebody who's dealing with this in some way, um, it, it constantly amazes me how entrepreneurial bad guys can be. Um, as, as things change, they are incredibly creative about ways in which they can do harm. Um, and it's not always um, incredibly you know, technical, sophisticated uh, ways, as Chris talked about. Most of these problems arise with human error. Um, people just responding to emails or to inquiries uh, that had they uh, engaged in some of the things that Chris talked about never would have happened. Um, sim simple things like we've had clients recently that are getting contacted by uh, quote unquote customers with whom they've done business for a long time in emails and correspondence that looked absolutely legitimate. Um, 
informing them that they have a new bank relationship and new wiring instructions um, and, or, and, uh, and, 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 you know, some money should be exchanged in a different way. And it may seem um, unlikely, but some people respond to that stuff. Um, and there's no technical uh, fix for that. It's, it's, it's human error in informing people to be aware of it. And I think one of the things that Chris said, among the many valuable things he said, um, is, you know, you can't rely just on technology in your IT department uh, to be the protectors of your data. Every single person in your team has to be aware of it, has to be thinking about it. Uh, and, and we're really trying to impress that on our relationships and our clients, uh, and certainly with, within our firm. We're, we're, we're a target like everybody else. Um, so this, this, what you said to us, Chris, and the materials that you provided, um, I think are gonna go a long way to helping a lot of us do a better job of this. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is, if you do find yourself the victim of any of this, uh, time is not on your side. <laughs> uh, it's not going to get better. It's not going to go away. And like Chris said, uh, we don't recommend ever to clients that they do what is demanded of them. It seldom solves the problem. Usually, just makes it worse. Um, call your professional, uh, whether it's your, you know, whether it's Chris or someone like Chris, or whether it's me or, or somebody like me. Um, call right away. It's in, it's incredibly important. Time is not your friend. Um, and deal with it quickly. So that's all I have to say. And so want to yeah, say thanks, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, I, before we move on to any other questions, I wanted to um, let Kate talk if, if you had comments about the cyber rider or anything. Yeah, thank you for that. And just and just listening to um, to everything I know. And like I said in the beginning, you know, a lot of my clients um, have that exposure with the protected health information, um, including my company as well. Um, and we have, um, so while I deal with the health and welfare side of it, we do have um, our sister company, which is Gallagher Bassett, which um, they're happy to have that conversation, make introductions about what's available for, for lines of coverage for this, for institutions really of any size in any industry. Great. Any other questions for Chris or, or Lou or Kate or any of anyone? Um, well, so I just want to make sure to thank again our guest speaker and our sponsors. Um, this has been a very challenging year and appreciate um, all your support for the chamber this year for Lou and Kate you guys, and Satya too is on our board and um, certainly a wonderful supporter of the chamber. Um, as we said, I will send out Chris's slides to everybody and also a recording of this webinar. Um, I will also um, ask you to be thinking about suggested topics or speakers for 2021 for this series. Um, I think it's, you know, I want to make sure that this is useful That's information Zoom. for you, you all. Give me so 10 minutes? You can reach out to me at any time with suggestions. Um, again, thank you all for joining and I wish you all very happy holidays and healthy New Year. Okay, I'll call you a few minutes. Thank you. Paul. Thanks, everyone. Happy holidays. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Bye. Bye, Satya. Happy holidays. You too.